Hello and welcome to Salon Talks. I'm Andrew O'Hare, Executive Editor of Salon. Uh, it's a great uh, privilege and challenge uh, to greet my guest today, who is the longtime Washington Post columnist George Will, uh, viewed as a dean or godfather of the conservative movement and the author of a very impressive and challenging new book called The Conservative Sensibility. George joins us from Washington. Thank you. I think being the dean of conservatives is like being the tallest building in Topeka, but I'll take it. <laughs> and, you know, you, you've written this really, uh, I think this is the kind of book for which the word, the, the phrase magisterial tome was invented. Some people may want to compare it to, you know, the kind of book that has other uses. You could use it to prop the screen door open or, or to flatten out papers on top of your desk. But it is, it is a book of impressive size, and I wasn't really... I wasn't really expecting that, and it's a remarkable defense of, of, as you call it, the conservative sensibility. I want to get to that second word, but first of all, what was sort of the, the inciting incident? What motivated you to write a book defending conservative philosophy right now? Well, first of all, the political party that has been the vessel of American conservatism for many years is not any longer. It is now a vessel of populism, and populism is just about everything that conservatism is not. Uh, second, it, it, the revival of conservatism will require reconnecting it with the very distinguished pedigree of ideas behind it, from Madison through Lincoln to Hayek and Milton Friedman and all the rest. So it seemed, uh, seemed like the time. Although I should say, I began writing this long before the 2016 election. I was going to say, it seems like a work that took much longer than that, and I suppose you have not just anticipated but answered my next question, which is, uh, to what extent does the Republican Party, uh, as it stands in, on, on the cusp of a new presidential election, embody any of the sensibility that you're talking about? Very little nowadays. Uh, the party is a part of the cult of the current president, and therefore it is a populist party, and as I say, populism is everything that conservatism isn't. Populism believes in the direct translation of the people's passions. Passions are considered good by populists. Passions were considered the fundamental political problem by the founders. Populism believes in the direct translation of the passions into governance through the instrumentality of an emancipated Caesarism, through a kind of watery Caesarism of the modern presidency. The Madisonian conservatism, which uh, I hope to, I've represented well in my book, believes that majority opinion is going to rule and ought to rule, but it should be refined and filtered through institutions, through the separation of powers, slowed down and tempered before it is allowed to, uh, to have its way. Well, you know, I suppose everybody's going to ask you what you... In a sense, uh, what, what audience you hope to reach here? I mean, one could, I'm sure you're going to be exposed to some mockery as a result of this book. One could suggest that you're trying to sell, you know, typewriters to today's teenagers or, you know, buggy whips to Henry Ford's consumers or something. Where do you see hope for a revival of your vision of conservatism? Well, there is an enormous appetite in this country, and the bestseller lists indicate it, for books about the founders. Usually these are biographies, Hamilton, Washington, Madison, Jefferson, all the rest. Uh, this is an intellectual biography, if you will, of the American founding, because the answer to the frequently and properly asked question, what do conservatives wish to conserve, is the American founding, which really means three things. First is the doctrine of natural rights. Those are rights that are essential to the flourishing of people of our nature. You notice I define natural rights without reference to a creator. With any, There's no theism involved in this. Second is the idea of a constant human nature. That is, it postulates that human beings are not simply creatures that take on the coloration of the culture in which they're situated. That view of, of mankind, of an ultimate plastic mankind, has emancipated dangerous government projects in the 20th century to remake human beings by remaking the culture surrounding them. Third, from this it flows the idea of a separation of powers. That is, a government strong enough to secure our rights, to use the verb in the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, governments are instituted to secure our rights, but not so strong as to threaten them. 
and to have majority rule, but majorities uh, composed of constantly shifting um, uh, coalitions of minorities so that there's no such thing as a stable, tyrannical majority. Sure. Um, now, you, 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 I, there's so many things we could, we could unpack here. But when you talk about the growth of the state which is, and, and the intrusiveness of the state, which is certainly one of the themes of conservative politics and one of the objections to liberal or progressive politics, and that's consistent. I'm going to, whether or not we agree, we may not, uh, I'm going to grant you the consistency of that. But wouldn't you agree that both political parties, certainly through from the second half of the 20th century to now, contributed to two things, the, the, the growth of the state and its intrusiveness in many areas and the growing power of the presidency. Absolutely, both have contributed. Let's take the presidency first, because one of the themes of my book is uh, against the cult of the modern presidency. Uh, for many years, conservatives understood that first with Teddy Roosevelt and his theory of the stewardship presidency, presidents free to do anything they are not explicitly forbidden to do, followed by Woodrow Wilson, who said the president's job is to interpret the national mood to the nation and therefore required a, a marginalized Congress. Through the man who came to Washington to be Assistant Secretary of the Navy under Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, who was the first to address the American people. These were the first two words of his first inaugural address. He began, my friends, postulating this new intimacy we were to have with the presidency. Through Lyndon Johnson, who came to Washington to work in the New Deal and is the only Washington, only president to spend his entire adult life in Washington. Through all of these strong presidents, conservatives said they are the principal engines of the growth of government. Therefore, they took as one of their texts James Burnham's magisterial book, uh, Congress and the American Tradition, and they argued for uh, congressional supremacy. They said Congress is Article One of the Constitution for a reason. Sure. That the president's job's defined job defined concisely uh, in Article Two is to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. That makes him definitionally subordinate to those who make the laws. Conservatives understood congressional supremacy then. Beginning at noon, January 20th, 1981, they begin to have the heady experience of a charismatic president of their own and Ronald Reagan. And they said, gosh, this is fun. And they've been participants ever since, as you suggest, in the uh, celebration of the emancipated president. Yeah, and, and uh, as, as you're aware, um, it, it was not just uh, Democrats may get the blame for blowing up the budget deficit. The budget deficit expanded just as fast, if not faster, faster. Under, under President Reagan and the two presidents Bush. Well, yeah, I mean, my theory is that for all the talk about American discord today, the real threat is a consensus, and it's as broad as the Republic, as deep as the Grand Canyon. It runs from Elizabeth Warren on the left to Ted Cruz on the right, and it is simply this, that we should have a large, generous, active, a well-armed entitlement state and not pay for it. Everyone's agreed on that. That we should give the American people a dollar's worth of government, charge them 80 cents for it, fob a fifth of the cost of the government off on the unconsenting because unborn future taxpayers. The public thinks this is a terrific idea and everyone gets to govern happily. Uh, liberals by, uh, by being unconstrained by scarcity, conservatives by making big government cheap, and the public by getting away with murder. Uh, it is, however, decadent democracy. To, uh, we, used to, we used to borrow money for the future. We fought wars for the future, built roads, harbors, bridges for the future. Now, we're borrowing from the future to finance our own consumption of government goods and services. If that isn't decadent, I don't know what is. Uh, it's, a, it's a compelling argument. One of the things I, I want to challenge is, is what I see as the essential conflict that you lay out between what you define as conservative or progressive sensibilities, to use your word, or, or ideologies. Um, 
I want to congratulate you, first of all, for saying that American conservatism is different from European conservatism. Uh, you, you use the phrase throne and altar blood and soil nostalgia in discussing European conservatism. That seems like a clear reference to the current direction of the Republican Party. And, and uh, I, I know that the name of the current president doesn't appear in, in this book, but that feels like a reference. Was it intended that way? Not really. Uh, the, the, sort of a, a, an acknowledgement that there is the Steve Bannon style of conservatism out there. It is a, a sublime ar irony that those who say they're trying to make America great again are doing so by borrowing European conservatism. European conservatism began in the defense of existing hierarchies, including established churches and all the rest and class society. Uh, and it, it became articulate through Edmund Burke, who was in frank recoil against the French Revolution. Of course. It crossed the Atlantic and became something very different. Burke is the bridge across the Atlantic in that his understanding of the, the natural processes of an organic society is a clear cousin to Hayek's idea of the spontaneous order of a contractual society of restless market yes. individualists. But American conservatism exists to reconcile people to the constant churning of a sort that makes, and the dynamism and the openness of society that makes a lot of European conservatives queasy. Uh, what I wanted to what I wanted to to bring up here is is the notion that on the one hand, conservatives, as you define them, are defending the principles of the founders, most notably the idea that there are natural rights that pertain to all human yes. beings, as delineated by Jefferson in the most famous passage of the Declaration of Independence, of course. But on the other side of that, you posit that progressives don't agree with that. Progressives don't perceive uh, that human beings have any natural rights. It's all conditional. It's all shaped by society. I understand the distinction that you are making, but I don't think that any of the two dozen Democrats who are running to replace Donald Trump right now, including Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, I don't think if you asked them this question that they would deny that there are certain uh, rights that pertain to all humans. They might disagree about what they are and how to define them and how to, how to defend them. But I don't think any of them would say that they don't exist. Frankly, today's presidential candidates, not just in the 2020 cycle, but in 16, 12, 8, presidential candidates are too busy tallying up votes for the, the Iowa caucuses to think about the philosophic premises of their lives. Certainly, Woodrow Wilson said, do not read the first two paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence. It will only mislead you. Certainly, Franklin Roosevelt said in his September 23rd, 1932 campaign speech to the Commonwealth Club of San Francisco, made it very clear that rights are granted by government, that they are part of the compact. The people give the government power and the government gives people such rights as it thinks serve the public good. This is a very, very clear distinction. I think uh, Roosevelt and Wilson were probably more aware, more self-conscious about what they were doing than some of today's progressives. That's, a, that's an interesting hypothesis. I, I, I think that, I mean, you're aware that most people in, and I'm actually not a defender of the Democratic Party. I'm not here to, to fulfill that role. And I'm certainly not a defender of Woodrow Wilson, who many of today's self-styled progressives would, would reject. I guess you would suggest they would reject him for for uh, other reasons, for his uh, outspoken elitism, for the fact that he was perhaps the most racist, most overtly racist president after the Civil War. Uh, and, and uh, you know, he's almost anathema among liberals and progressives today. I guess you would say that his ideology is still driving the train, though. Yes, I, th I think they're selectively anti-Wilson. A few years ago, uh, some African-American students at, at Princeton, where I, I was a trustee for a while, uh, became aware of his extremely retrograde views about race and wanted to, to take his name off certain things and all the rest. I uh, told the president of Princeton I would come to Princeton and give a course to teach them how to comprehensively dislike Woodrow Wilson. You, 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 you're doing this very interesting dance involving the, the writing of the Constitution and the influence of, of John Locke on the, what you define as 
classical liberalism turned into American conservatism, which is going to confuse many people, but you're clearly correct about that. You're really correct about that heritage. The part I want to challenge is whether uh, the Constitution is as dependent on the concept of, of limited government as you would like it to be. I feel as if uh, there's considerable evidence that George Washington, for example, welcomed the Constitution because of the climate of rural rebellion that was going on in western Massachusetts and upstate New York at the time, and felt that a relatively strong central government was going to be necessary to keep this, the, this, these 13 states from coming unglued. There's no question that Shays' Rebellion uh, was a, a, a fire bell in the night, to adopt a phrase from Thomas Jefferson. There's no question that when James Madison called the Annapolis Convention, to which only seven uh, states sent delegates, uh, it was to begin to interest people in a stronger central government than was possible under the Articles of Confederation. There's no question that George Washington thought correctly that we very nearly lost the American Revolution because the central government did not have taxing and spending and other powers requisite for the exigencies of a continental nation. Unquestionably, this was an attempt to build a stronger government. The question is, how strong? The question is, are we in any sense still, as Madison defined us, as a government of delegated enumerated and limited powers. He says in Federalist 45, I believe it is, that the powers granted to the government under the proposed constitution are few and discreet and enumerated. It's clearly not so anymore. The doctrine of enumerated powers is, is dead as a doornail. I, I, I have so many lost causes in my past, I know one when I see one. And that sort of limited government, limited by, say, uh, judicial enforcement of limits, is, is a lost cause. Government will only be limited by, uh, at the end of the day, public opinion, which is shiftable sand. And people like me write books like this as shovels to shift the sand. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know how far you're going to get with, a, with, a, uh, with the idea of a balanced budget amendment. Setting aside the question of whether it's a good, or, good idea or not, which we could discuss ad infinitum, I mean, do you see anything on the horizon that feels like political movement toward that kind of sentiment? Well, I, I see two things. First of all, I do think that the, the balanced budget amendment that I outline in my book, I didn't author it, but I borrowed it from some clever and experienced gentlemen, I think that is a politically saleable proposition. I also think, and we've seen this actually in the Supreme Court in the last few months, the Supreme Court for the first time since 1935 might begin to enforce the non-delegation doctrine. That is, the first substantive words of the Constitution, the first words after the preamble, say that all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States. Congress does not have the power to divest itself of essentially legislative powers, giving them to the executive branch. That is the nature of modern government. Congress passes what Chris DeMuth, a very wise Washingtonian, has called velities. It says, we should all have a clean environment. You people in the executive branch fill in the details. We should have quality education. You people in the executive branch make all the difficult choices and trade-offs. We get credit for noble sentiments. You get the difficult job of, of abuse and, fun and funding. Uh, when the court, uh, in its last term at the end of June, uh, suggested it might be reviving the non-delegation doctrine, Justice Elena Kagan said, why this makes all of modern government unconstitutional, to which some of us said it's about time, yes. Uh, but we're in for, I think, a robust argument about the compatibility of the, the methods and operation of the administrative state with the premises of the Constitution. Well, that's a fascinating philosophical and, and legal point, but to, to Justice Kagan's comment about rendering uh, much of the machinery of government unconstitutional, 
you go too far in that John Locke direction and you end up like those guys who took, took over the National Wildlife Refuge in Eastern Oregon early in 2016 <laughs> on the theory that no level of government above the county sheriff was, was valid under the Constitution. I imagine you don't agree with that, but... You, you imagine <laughs> correctly. <laughs> but no, that, I, that sentiment is out there. Okay. There's nothing in conservatism incompatible with ameliorative government. There's nothing incompatible with, in, in, in conservative with in conservatism with measures for the public health and safety. Remember, as we, you and I just said a moment ago, the intellectual pinup in my book is James Madison, who started the ball rolling toward the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia precisely to cure the defects of the Articles of Confederation to make them, as he said, adequate to the exigencies of the Union. Uh, the, the section of your book that's about the judiciary is, I think, really fascinating. There's no way for us to summarize it in, in, in just a minute. I, I really do admire the intellectual flexibility with which you sort of take down both liberal or progressive and conservative pieties about how the judiciary should function and suggest that both sides have gotten it wrong to some degree. But in the contemporary climate, when the Supreme Court and the rest of the federal judiciary ever since, certainly ever since Bush v. Gore, whatever we make of that decision, has been perceived as a partisan political uh, machine uh, in which Republican judges vote one way and Democratic judges vote another way. I know that Chief Justice Roberts has tried to push back against that, but it, how do we get back, can we get back to a time when the judiciary is viewed actually as an independent branch that, that makes, its, makes its decisions without such considerations? Yes, I, I think we can. I, I, I'm not sure the public is as jaundiced as, as you and, and many others are about the su Supreme Court. I'm amazed by the fact that Bush v. Gore, for example, was accepted with such equanimity by the American public. The court is still living off the enormous infusion of prestige it got in 1954 when, with Brown versus Board of Education, it did something that the nation's majoritarian institutions could not do and that the public thought was, was uh, just. So I think the prestige of the Supreme Court is broader and more durable uh, than some people think. Now, conservatives for many years recoiling against some of the more freewheeling decisions of the Warren Court, have adopted, without knowing they were adopting it, the language of progressivism. It was progressives who said, the judiciary should be more passive, it should be more deferential, it should be more restrained regarding uh, the actions of the political branches of government. It was, after all, the, cons the progressives' great pinup, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who said, if the American people want to go to hell, I will help them, it's my job. What I'm arguing for is a more engaged judiciary that says deference often is dereliction of the duty to apply the Constitution, a written Constitution, to the acts of the majoritarian branches of government. My view of an engaged judiciary says that the counter-majoritarian difficulty is no difficulty at all that indeed America is not about majorities, it's not about a process majority rule, it's about a condition, liberty. And when liberty is threatened by majorities, capricious majorities or tyrannical majorities, uh, it is the duty of the uh, uh, court not to help the American people go to hell. Well, I, I was struck by, having, by reading that uh, chapter in the immediate aftermath of the court's recent decision in which uh, Chief Justice Roberts uh, you know, overturned the government's decision about that question in the census based on the idea that the reason behind it had been contrived, had been cooked up for, for political purposes. And that struck me as in line with your argument in a way because it is. He, Roberts it was, was setting aside the question of whether, whether, whether this was a valid thing to have in the census and looking at the intention behind it. Yeah, I think you, that's very astute of you, and, and uh, I wish I, oh, I've got it right here, if I may refer to it. There's a thing in the Atlantic by John Yu and James Phillips, Stanford Phillips of Constitutional Law Center, and you of, uh, uh, John Yu is, a, I think, at Berkeley now, and they argue that properly read, uh, the census decision is another brick on, on a wall that is being built uh, to circumscribe the administrative state. That's an interesting hypothesis. Uh, 
<laughs> that's a, there's so many tangents we could go off on here, and I should let you go very soon, but I want to quickly touch on the, cool. your chapter on the economy, which is also so interesting and probably the one that for interested readers on the, from the center to the left uh, uh, side of the political uh, uh, continuum are going to have the most difficulty uh, sympathizing with. You seem to be suggesting not only that inequality, economic inequality or wealth inequality as we say these days, is not really a problem, but also that you think progressive taxation and the administrative state, to use your favorite term, have to some extent created that problem? Well, first of all, on progressive taxation, as, as I said earlier, I know a lost cause when I see one. I, I do take a, a big chunk of that chapter to examine uh, a, a famous essay written by two University of Chicago economists, about, or lawyers about 60 years ago, called The Uneasy Case for Progressive Taxation, in order to demonstrate that something that is just taken for granted now does have only an uneasy case behind it. Uh, my argument about in, in the chapter titled Political Economy is that the economy is a, is a political choice that we have and that vast disparities of wealth are, not, are, are inherently not very morally significant unless and until they translate into, for example, inequitable uh, differences of political power, which I think is, is actually difficult to explain. I give a lot of talks around the country and I often ask my, my audience, I say, I'd like a show of hands. How many of you have in your pockets an Apple product? And a sea of hands goes up. And how many have Apple products at home? And more hands go up. And then I say, I'd like a show of hands. How many of you resent the fact that Steve Jobs died a billionaire? No hands go up. American people know, A, he deserved it. And B, he didn't get most of the value of what he produced. We got it. So I, I really think the American people have a pretty commonsensical view that, that it is, there's a moral imperative that everyone have a sort of base level of sufficiency, uh, but a much weaker case for us to get uh, upset about the existence of billionaires. Sure, but uh, the question of whether Jamie Dimon deserves to be as rich as he is may be a different question from the question of Steve Jobs. I don't think so. I think Jamie Dimon uh, uh, makes, a, makes a serious contribution to value in, in, in the creation of wealth. Uh, I understand Marx and the surplus value. Uh, I've seen it applied to baseball. People say, well, shouldn't the players get almost all the wealth? And the answer is no, because general managers who develop players and trade players and produce players and the people who build the, the ballparks, everyone's involved in many ways in this wealth creation. So uh, some people are going to get very much richer than others, including Mike Trout. <laughs> Mike Trout is not, is not in danger of being an, a, an oppressed member of society, no. But do you not perceive what has been referred to as a structural and demographic problem where we have... Uh, flat or in some cases declining real incomes for a pretty large proportion of the population, uh, increasing amounts of wealth flowing to the top, and, uh, and, and a degree of social and political discord uh, coming out of that, which appears to be unpredictable and to have unpredictable consequences. Is that not accurate? No, that's not inaccurate. Uh, there, there are several questions here, however. One is, is one of, of moral reasoning. Uh, it is perfectly possible to say, as I do, that there's limited moral significance to the existence of billionaires, but also to say that there is a, simply a political problem, a factual political problem in the resentments that are produced by vast disparities of wealth. This is an increasing problem in our society because our society is increasingly cognitively stratified. Uh, more and more wealth flowing to those who have the education or credentials, credentials and education, God knows are not the same thing, but the flow of wealth to those who are nimble at manipulating the information that is the heart of the new economy. Uh, how we solve this problem, I don't know, but certainly no conservative of any standing denies that that is a problem. 
Well, I feel like we could go on for, for hours. One, one more thing before we go. The word sensibility, I did want to touch on that. Why is this book called The Conservative Sensibility rather than using another word, philosophy or ideology or, or, or vision or something like that? By sensibility, I mean more than an attitude, but less than an agenda. I didn't want to write another a Washington book with bullet points saying, pass these 10 things and we'll have a land fit for heroes. I didn't want to say, this is what you want to think. I want to help people understand how to think about politics. And by sensibility, I mean this. There is a, there's a sense in which one's, how one responds to the flux of life uh, precedes political philosophy. Often our philosophy is we develop in order to not rationalize, but justify. Uh, our response to events and, and, and things around us. Uh, I'll put it this way. Virginia Postrel, a very fine Washington writer, has said the Bible reduced to one sentence is God created men and women and then lost control of events. The conservative sensibility says that's a good thing. We don't like control. We like the exhilaration of an open society constantly churning in the spontaneous order of a contractual market society. The progressive mentality increasingly says things out of control are not a good thing. And we want uh, an administrative state stocked by experts, run by a president with a marginalized Congress not interfering too much, to bring order to things. Uh, conservatives say that is uh, Progressives need what Hayek called epistemic humility. That is some understanding of the li how little we know about what we are trying to do and what we can control. I agree with you about that. I don't think I agree with you about the definition of progressives and what we, what we want, but we could go in circles uh, on that one. Can you envision yourself voting for either major party candidate next year? Uh, I cannot imagine myself, I, I will not vote for the Republican candidate if it's the current incumbent. Uh, I can imagine myself voting for a, a, a number of Democrats. Uh, failing that, I wrote in Ben Sass in, in 2016, and I can write in someone else. Uh, George Will, uh, author of the uh, really fascinating new book, Con The Conservative Sensibility, I recommend it, columnist for The Washington Post, a Pulitzer Prize winner. George, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. I've enjoyed this very much.